self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to, the, welcome to Boston as we celebrate the 245th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Police Fife, retired U.S. Army, and I'm from that. Winston Churchill once said that American democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the other forms that have been tried. It is the initiation of that democracy, the signing of the Declaration of Independence that we celebrate here in Boston today, as we have for well over 242 years. Our celebration is dedicated to the men and women of the United States Armed Forces. We will begin, at, we'll begin today with our traditional ceremony, followed by Boston's Independence Day Parade. First off on our parade route will be the Granary Burial Ground for a short ceremony in the laying of wreaths at the grave of John Hancock, Peter Faneuil, Robert Creek Paint, Samuel Adams, and Christus Adams. The parade will then continue to the Old State House for the annual 4th of July reading of the Declaration of Independence. Joining me here on the stage this morning, City Councilors Ed Flynn and Michelle Wu. Brigadier General John Bristol, Commander, Massachusetts Army National Guard, Mayor Kim Jane, Ms. Peyton Davis, Director, Office of Tourism, Sports and Entertainment, Commissioner of Veterans Services for the City of Boston, Robert Santiago, Captain Robert Inlet, Captain Commanding of the Ancient Honorable Artillery Company and his staff, First Lieutenant David Champa, Second Lieutenant Timothy Perry, and Adjutant Command Sergeant Major Carlos Reynos Rivera. The Ancient Rival Artillery Company of Massachusetts holds the distinction of being the oldest chartered military organization in North America and the third oldest chartered military organization in the world. And last but not least, the vocalist Dana Whiteside. Captain Inlet, Commander of the Ancient Army Artillery Company, kind of have your adjutant, Command Sergeant Major Ramos Rivera, call the parade to attention and present arms for the singing of the National Anthem by Dana Whiteside, accompanied by the Zabba Military Band, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance.
I'm really grateful to all of our residents who continue to do the work every single day to lift up the values and the ideals of our nation, to make sure that we are living out that truth every single day. So I won't speak long. I just want to say happy birthday. 245 years of our nation is a great thing to celebrate. Let's continue to do the work every single day to make sure we're living out those ideals and our values. Thank you.
the third oldest burial ground in Boston proper. Named for the 12,000 bushel grain storage building that was located next door where the present Park Street Church stands to my right. The burial ground was renamed the Granary in 1737. The graveyard has 2,345 markers. Some say as many as 8,000 people are buried here. Since funerals were expensive in the colonial times, there would be one headstone per family. But each grave contains as many as 20 bodies. We're here today to honor five of Boston's patriots. Alongside the far wall to the southwest, to my right, is the elaborately embellished marker of John Hancock's tomb. The signature of John Hancock on the Declaration of Independence is the most flamboyant and easily recognizable of all. The decree had been delivered from England in early 1776, offering a large reward for the capture of several leading figures. Hancock was one of them. On the signing of the Declaration, he commented, the British Ministry read the name without spectacles. Let them double that reward. At the left rear of the cemetery, along the back wall, is the location where Peter Faneuil is buried. Peter Faneuil, 1700-1743, was a wealthy American colonial merchant and philanthropist who donated Faneuil Hall to Boston. The roof above the market stalls became a civic center where so many pre-revolutionary pre meetings were held that Faneuil Hall became known as America's Cradle of Liberty. It is only fitting that we have historically concluded the program there every other 4th of July since 1783. On the right-hand wall opposite John Hancock's tomb, is a plaque marking the tomb of Robert Tree Payne. Robert Tree Payne was a native of Massachusetts, born in 1731. He was elected to the provincial assembly, and that body selected him to attend the first Continental Congress. Payne served on committees which formed the rules of debate and later served as a chairman of the committee, charged with acquiring gunpowder for the Continental Army. He also authorized the final appeal to the king, known as the Olive Branch Petition in 1775. Payne was re-elected to represent Massachusetts as the Continental Congress of 1776. He participated in the debates leading to a resolution for independence and his signature appears on the Declaration of Independence. In the front right corner is a family plot of Samuel Adams. It is interesting to note that Sam Adams had the Boston Massacre of victims interned here on his family plot. He was appointed as a representative to the Continental Congress, where he was most noted for his oratory skills and as a passionate advocate for independence from Britain. In 1776, as a delegate, to the Continental Congress who signed the Declaration of Independence. Adams retired from Congress in 1781 and returned to Massachusetts to become a leading member of that state's convention to form a constitution. In 1789, he was appointed Lieutenant Governor of the state. In 1794, he was elected governor and was re-elected annually until 1797 when he retired for health reasons. He, along with John Adams, Robert Tree Payne, brings the number of signers of the Declaration of Independence in the Granary to three. In the front right corner buried near Samuel Adams' tomb on the Adams family plot is Crispus Attucks and four other members of the Boston Massacre. Crispus Attucks, born in Framingham, Massachusetts in 1723. Crispus Attucks was an American Stevador of American, of African and Native American descent, widely regarded as the first person killed in the Boston Massacre, and thus the first American killed in the American Revolution. This event helped fuel the outrage 
against British rule and spurred on the American Revolution. Tension mounted rapidly, and when one of the soldiers was struck, the others fired their muskets, killing three of the Americans instantly and mortally wounding two others. Paddock was the first to fall, thus becoming one of the first men to lose his life in the cause of American independence. His body was carried to Faneuil Hall, where it laid in state until March 8, when all five victims were buried in the common grave. Paddock was the only victim from the Boston Massacre whose name was widely remembered. In 1888, Christmas Paddock's monument was unveiled in the Boston Common. Captain Nimlin, Captain Commanding of the Ancient Honorable Artillery Company, kindly have your adjutant, Command Sergeant Major Ramos Rivera, call the parade to attention and present arms for the firing of the musket volley and followed by taps. just concludes today's great grave-sized ceremony here at the Granary Burial Ground. The parade will reform and continue on to the old state house.
good idea. There's a gimbal that has controls over here. Got it. Get the ball. Nice. Good. I don't have that. Ladies and gentlemen, the mayor of Boston, Mayor Gianni. Good morning. Good morning. What an amazing birthday party for our nation. Good morning. We're here to celebrate. The 4th of July as Independence Day for our nation. And Boston is the birthplace of our country. And so we have a lot to be proud of here as we continue to lead our nation. Not just a nation of first, but a nation, uh, a, a city of first, but a city that has done the best. And we have to continue to do that work to make sure that we are living up to the ideals of our country where we can all live freely in America and in the city of Boston. So I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to celebrate with you this morning, the 245th birthday of our nation. Let's continue to make sure that Boston is strong and stronger than ever before. Happy birthday. Five men were among the first casualties in the battle for independence in what would later be known as the Boston Massacre. From 1771 to 1782, a patriotic oration had been given from this very balcony on July 18, 1776. The Declaration of Independence was first proclaimed to the citizens of Boston from this very spot. As in revolutionary time, I ask our trumpeter to sound assembly. Santiago 
to lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, oh I know this. All civilians, please uncover, right hand over heart. All those in the uniform, hand salute. Please feel free to recite with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, now. Good morning. An action of the Second Continental Congress, July 4, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume amongst the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the name which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitled them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impelled them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that their creator, endowed by, endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles in organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than are to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing inevitably to the object convinces a design to reduce them under absolute deposition, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having a direct object, the establishment of absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to, to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws to the accommodation of large districts of people. Unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them 
informidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasion on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolution to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all of the dangers of invasion from without and convolutions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and rising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary power. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount in payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislature. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops amongst us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us, in many cases, of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for the introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws and altering fundamentally the forms of our government for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravished our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, dissolution, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy of the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their, their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. 
Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity. And we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them, as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and are fought right to be free and independent states. between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliance, establish Congress, and do all other acts and things which independent states may have right to. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. On behalf of the ancient and honorable artillery company of Massachusetts, welcome to Boston. We hope you all have a very happy Fourth of July. It feels great to once again be able to gather after not having this ceremony last year. And let us not forget why we celebrate this holiday. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. It is my great privilege and honor as a native of Boston, Roxbury, to be with you all and to lend my voice in the celebration of this great holiday celebrating freedom in America, wishing you all the happiest of Independence Days.
Bostonians just as much as you are, and we're very happy to be out here on this beautiful New England 4th of July. So we are a pipe and drum corps. We play these weird instruments. We dress kind of funny. I have a pop quiz for you guys. Who remembers her high school history class? Who is the first president of the United States of America? George Washington. George Washington. Good job. So George Washington's army dressed kind of funny. They wore Generally, their musicians would wear the inverse colors so you can see us dressed in these gorgeous white coats with our proper wigs and tricorps hats. So we're going to play about 15 or 20 minutes of these sets for you guys today. I hope you enjoy it and have a happy 4th of July.
Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you name it, MCB fights for Trump. We uh, make our way around. We're not just in the Boston area. We do perform all around the world, most recently back in 2018 in Edinburgh, Scotland. So we are supporting Central Lights Day. We're going to use the fun on social media. If you want to take a little bit of us home, you can buy one of our movies, Scott Pat Sets. You may not have heard of it, but I'm only 23 and I certainly have. So if you want one,
guys enjoy the rest of your 4th of July. Uh, just as a reminder, we are the Middlesex County Volunteers to buy some drums. If you're interested in a CD, we do have them available for $10 cash. Uh, we'll do a couple more sets before we take off. Uh, please have a happy, healthy, and safe 4th of July. It's great to be out playing for you guys. Thank you so much.
to us, take photos. Enjoy your happy 4th of July. Fight for you. Here's me.